Hi there, thanks for joining me. This video is part of a small series um, which round up um, clips which I found and used as part of research for my book Retreat. Um, this video is about um, Esalen and the culture around it and the human potential movement. This isn't directly related to the counterculture but the sort of brother and sister um, in relation to one another. Um, so uh, Esalen is still going strong but the counterculture burnt out essentially. The first four clips deal with what I would say is sort of representations of the Esalen culture. There is um, the screenwriter of, of Bob Carroll, Ted and Alice talking about that film which was sort of 1969 uh, Hollywood movie which took on board the uh, human potential movement culture or that exploratory culture that came out of Esalen. And then there's amusingly a um, Quentin Tarantino um, in relation to his latest film talking about how much he liked uh, Bob Carroll, Ted and Alice. And the final clip is a, from 1980 a trailer for a film called Serial which, which kind of shows how the um, the public perception of this culture changed from one of suspicion and fear to um, satire uh, and that's closely parallels how um, writing like the works of um, Tom Wolfe in the article The Me Decade and Christopher Lash in The Culture of Narcissism um, turned on the essentially benign um, proto-wellness culture uh, and um, inviscerated it. They all assume none of it was true. What's true is that the film was based on fact, but those facts came from an article Mazursky had read. I got the idea from an article I saw in Time magazine about a, psych a psychiatrist in Fritz Perls. And there was an article about a place called Esalen, and it had a photograph of Fritz Perls and apparently some of his patients sitting in a hot tub in Esalen, outdoors, with the water bubbling, and it talked about a new kind of therapy, and counter therapy. And it is true that Mazursky and his wife did do some first-hand research. We went to Esalen together and had one of those experiences where we were weeping and crying, and, and the, all of the other ten people were saying, why do you treat her that way? Let her talk. It sort of helped uh, get the beginning of the story going. Nothing else happened to me. The rest is all made up. Hello everybody, hope you're enjoying the movie. This is uh, Quentin and Kim here at Intermission uh, to talk a little bit and actually uh, maybe bring up a couple of things that you've already seen now so we can talk a little bit more in depth about the film. Mazursky based the script on him and his wife Betsy going to like a weekend at a sexual encounter group type of mm -hmm. uh, place. And I think the philosophy that's, that's gotten across, in, in the movie it's called The Institute. Uh, and the philosophy that's gotten across, I mean, how would you describe it? It's like Self-examination, right. uh, uh, getting rid of hypocrisy, both self-hypocrisy and social hypocrisy yes. and sexual hypocrisy, uh, and about sexual freedom, almost an Anis Nin right. type of view of, hey, well, it is what it is. You Giving know? up your hang-ups. Yeah, get about, up your yeah. hang-ups. If, if, mm -hmm. if there were no hang-ups involved, then none of this would be a problem. Yes. Um, the Marin County things are not as they appear. There's plenty going on beneath that high glass beneath. Life. Good morning, America. Welcome to Marin County, California, where the search for the ultimate lifestyle is the goal of every man. Martha. Remember, I have a bad back. Hey, Rob! My friends are having a party. Every woman. Very apt, Carol, very apt. He wants me to goof off with him standing in a hammock. And every precocious child. Now, as far as Stokely's concerned, it's just a question of putting him in touch with his childhood. I'm only 10 years old, you dork. Serial, an adult look at the sometimes not-too-adult world of the country's most with it community. Eunice, meanness. Usness, weenus. Sickness. Serial, 
is a new brand of comedy. In an insane society, the same man must appear insane. Where'd you get that? Star Trek. Harvey. All right. Serious. Harvey, this is Mark. Hi, I'm a Harvey. Uh, Please, I can't. You don't eat it, you see it. The big star of the Essendon culture was the psychoanalyst Fritz Perls, um, the pioneer of Gestalt therapy. And the first clip has him describing or see, seeking to explain what Gestalt therapy means, um, which is very unclear in, in many ways. Um, the best description you might give of Gestalt therapy is that it's teaching people how to be natural. Um, and the second clip um, is a, a very unusual um, in terms of pearls because he was often a very aggressive therapist. It's a rather tender um, therapy session with um, some college students and actually gives a very good idea of how he saw um, Gestalt therapy working. From the perspective, from my perspective of retreat where I look a lot at the interface between Eastern religion and psychoanalysis uh, is particularly interesting because he describes the girl's reaction as a mini satori um, so thereby understanding um, the uh, successful psychoanalytic outcome as being a kind of integration um, and, and also as also by extension seeing satori as being um, not a kind of in a sense a Hindu sense of sort of blowing out into the cosmic self but actually um, a integral um, becoming of, of oneself The idea of Gestalt therapy is to change paper people into real people. I know it's a big mouthful. And to make the hollow men of our time come to life and teach him to use his inborn potential and being, let's say, a leader without a rebel, having a center instead of living lopsided. All these ideas sound very demanding, but I believe it's now possible that we can do it that we don't have to lie on the couch for years, decades, and centuries without essential changes. Now, in this course, I notice that you have disowned your eyes. Instead of having eyes, the eyes are in the outside world, and they are looking at you. Yeah, right. Now, could you try to discover your own eyes and tell us what you see? Use your eyes now. What do you see? And I see that I'm scared. That's not what you see. That's what you imagine. Well, all I see then are cameras and... Yeah and shapes and darkness. Uh-huh. Do you see Just people sitting there. Ah, you're waking up? <laughs> yeah. This is what I call the mini Satori. It's in contrast to the great Satori, the great waking up. This is a little <laughs> waking up. Suddenly one wakes out of a trance like you're being persecuted by the eyes of the world. Probably the second Esselin's biggest star at the time was the therapist uh, Will Schutz, who was responsible for encounter groups or um, popularising the uh, the idea of encounter groups. Um, however, 
um, John Lilly is a, who wasn't necessarily quite as central to the Essen story, um, definitely belongs within the narrative. And most of his um, or his important sensory deprivation work was done on on the grounds at Essen. Um, so it was great privilege that I had a, was was able to be interviewed by Jeffrey Mishlove. That was very good for me. Um, and you will see here a clip of um, John Lilly um, being interviewed by Jeffrey probably in the early 80s it's a uh, so that I've left um, the early thinking aloud um, intro on just because it's such a beautiful bit of sort of period graphics and and, and, and sound design um, and you can see uh, Lilly being interviewed uh, by Jeffrey and I, I it's uh, it's funny he's wearing his this bear skin um, with this deer stalker hat and uh, it's sort of slightly mush mouth you can't really understand what I can't really understand what he's saying in a second in his final comment which is I find quite funny uh, and then there is a clip um, from Altered States the trailer from Altered States which was obviously inspired by uh, by Lily's work <laughs> would be good to start with your famous maxim about what is true in the province of, of the mind. Could, could you begin by... <clears throat> in the province of the mind, what one believes to be true either is true or becomes true within certain limits. These limits are to be found experimentally and experientially. When so found, these limits turn out to be further beliefs to be transcended. In the province of the mind, there are no limits. However, the province of the body, there are definite limits not to be transcended. You've probably devoted your your whole life, uh, and certainly many decades recently, to to pushing to see, you know, what what really were the limits. Right. Going into new realities, taking on the belief systems of those realities, and then then coming back to your basic working reality and challenging those beliefs, integrating those beliefs. Right. With, with your own. In, in your writings, you've explored uh, almost every state of consciousness I could imagine, the various mystical levels of Satori, communication with extraterrestrials, communication with, with other species. You've established probably a, uh, a more significant mapping of, of inner space than, than almost any other modern modern person, and I think we all owe a, a great debt to you for that. But don't get stuck with those. I've abandoned all of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible, mm -hmm. because there are infinities within the mind. In the basement of one of the country's leading medical schools, Dr. Edward Jessup, candidate for a Nobel Prize, is conducting the most dangerous experiment in the history of science. And the subject of the experiment is himself. Ask him what kind of an experience I can expect. Blacked out. What happens during these blackout periods is you get the feeling of phenomenal acceleration, like you're being shot out over millions, billions of years. Time simply obliterates. You guys are shooting up with an untested drug that stacks up in the brain and works in the nucleus of the cell, and you don't call that dangerous. Now, I'm asking you to put the experiment off until we understand a little more in order to minimize the no risk. Way. I'm really frightened. We could be screwing around with this whole genetic structure. Now, how do we stop this? We've got millions of years stored away in that computer bank we call our minds. We have got trillions of dormant genes in us, our whole evolutionary past. Perhaps I've tapped into that. He may be on to something that is beyond our own comprehension. Now, because I believe him, I want this thing stopped. The hell was that? You okay? If you love me, if you love me, Eddie, get fired! Altered States. 
uh, looking at the, the, the long history of Esalen since 1962, uh, probably the other key figure, uh, and, and this is something that which Jeffrey Kapal states in his um, in his book on on, on Esalen, is um, Stanislav Grof. Uh, and we've got a couple of clips here. Um, the first, uh, an interview again on uh, New Thinking Aloud um, with uh, Stanislav Grof, talking about his um, post LSD career in, in a sense. Uh, and also uh, a fascinating interview with his um, his wife uh, Christina Groff, um, and the two of them worked out the uh, what what I guess you could call the the spiritual emergency um, concept while they were based at Esalen. Um, and Christina Groff's particularly fascinating um, perspectives on addiction uh, and alcoholism. <laughs> Welcome. Our topic for this program are new paradigms or new understandings about human beings and the universe in which we relate. And my guest today is Dr. Stanislas Groff, a psychiatrist and author of numerous books, including Human Encounters, The Human Encounter with Death, Realms of the Human Unconscious, Beyond the Brain, LSD Psychotherapy, Beyond Death, and other books and numerous articles as well. Welcome, Stan. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. In your work with the LSD psychotherapy and exploring the very depths of the human unconscious, you've made some very strong statements, Stan, and, and one of them seems to be that as we look deeply at the human mind, what we encounter are phenomena and perspectives that are simply beyond traditional ways of thinking of things. In other words, that we need to have a new understanding of ourselves and the world in which we relate. Yes, I would just expand it a little, right. uh, that just uh, the initial two decades of my work involved uh, clinical work with, uh, with psychedelics. The last ten years, uh, my wife Christina and I have been working with non-drug techniques, uh, which involves um, breathing, controlled breathing, uh, sound, music, certain kind of body work and we essentially see the whole spectrum, the same spectrum of experiences that we used to see in, in psychedelic work and also challenging uh, observations of the same mm -hmm. kind. So we are not discussing challenges just from the um, LSD experience. It would be a mistake then to say that all of these experiences reported under LSD are due to the effects of the drug alone. That's right. The best way you can understand uh, the effects of LSD is to say that it's an unspecific uh, catalyst mm -hmm. or it's an amplifier so that when you when you take LSD you are actually uh, taking a journey into your own psyche you don't mm -hmm. have an LSD experience yeah. so it's an experience mediated by the by the pharmacological effect one of the ways in which I understood LSD to digress a little bit about it is is that what it seems to do is act as a replacement or a blocker for the uh, neurohormone serotonin, which is a neural inhibitor. So it's inhibiting an inhibitor and allowing more neurons to, to fire. In other words, letting the, the brain do more of what it naturally does anyway. Yes, that's one of the, one of the major hypotheses about, you know, it's, there's no unanimity about that. Yeah. But it's very interesting that something like uh, increased rate of breathing can also induced very similar kinds of experiences mm -hmm. and of course if it happens without the intervention of a rather exotic drug if it happens with something as physiological as breathing it's very clear that we are discussing uh, certain dynamics of the human psyche mm -hmm. that we are not discussing some kind of toxic state what happened was in the process of hitting bottom I, I did have a profound spiritual experience uh, not in a church or a synagogue but in a treatment center and it was what I had been looking for for a very long time it uh, and so it began to show me immediately that there was this deep connection between the spirituality that I had always sought mm -hmm. out and also this yearning inside of me that I had mis mistakenly uh, filled with alcohol. Mm -hmm. well, I suppose your case is unique in that there had been so much preparation in terms of the spiritual work you had been doing 
And then you were able to sort of use the process of recovery from alcoholism in, in combination with that background mm -hmm. to I mean, to come to a point where now you're the author of a book about it. <laughs> well, it was, it was both a help and an obstacle because yes. I had to really become ordinary. And, you know, I had spent a lot of time in kind of non-ordinary worlds and mm -hmm. being interested in the spirit. And I had to get right back down to ground zero. Yeah. And then what was very surprising is that in the recovery community, um, there were spiritually based recovery programs and I became familiar with uh, for example the 12-step programs and I began to realize that something like the 12 steps contains within it the same wisdom as other spiritual traditions that I'd been attracted to. Uh, it was in much more ordinary kind of grounded language mm -hmm. than a lot of the traditions I'd been interested in um, and there was this large community of people who had been doing the work, who knew how to guide me, that I could uh, ask questions and, and uh, ask for support. Um, and it was like coming home. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, if we look at Alcoholics Anonymous and other 12-step programs, which are the major programs mm -hmm. in Western culture that are treating these problems, the cure for alcoholism is a spiritual path. I think so. I mean, f there's the reality that people can't improve the quality of their life unless they stop doing their addiction. Mm -hmm. So first of all, take care of the, the physical problem, uh, it, stop the addiction. So uh, I hope you enjoyed that uh, short clip. And uh, do please uh, check out the, uh, the other seven clips in, in, the, in the playlist. And, and if you're so inclined, um, Buy yourself a copy of uh, my book, Retreat, and there'll be a description in the description below um, where you can buy it on Amazon.